210 military units were thrown at the liquidation of the fallout of the catastrophe, which equals about 340,000 military personnel. The ones cleaning the roof got it the worst. They had lead vests, but the radiation was coming from below. And they weren't protected there. They were wearing ordinary, cheap imitation leather boots. They spent about a minute and a half, two minutes, on the roof each day. And then they were discharged, given a certificate and an award, 100 rubles, and then they disappeared to the vast peripheries of our motherland. On the roof, they gathered fuel and graphite from the reactor, shards of concrete and metal. It took about 20 to 30 seconds to fill a wheelbarrow, and then another 30 seconds to throw the garbage off the roof. These special wheelbarrows weighed 40 kilos just by themselves, so you can picture it. A lead vest, masks, and wheelbarrows, and insane speed. In the museum in Kyiv, they have a mold of a graphite the size of a soldier's cap. They say that if it were real, it would weigh 16 kilos. That's how dense and heavy graphite is. The radio-controlled machines they used often failed to carry out commands or did the opposite of what they were supposed to do because their electronics were disrupted by the high radiation. The most reliable robots were the soldiers. They were christened the Green Robots. Some 3,600 soldiers worked on the roof of the ruined reactor. They slept on the ground in tents. They were young guys. These people don't exist anymore just the documents in our museum with their names. And that is an excerpt from the deputy head of the executive committee of the Shield of Chernobyl Association, Sergei Sobolov. And today, guys, we're going to be talking about the Chernobyl disaster, and more specifically, Henry's time spent very much on site at Chernobyl. Yeah, Josh. So uh, it was 2015 was when I got to go to Chernobyl. And uh, if I thought it was foreign, a uh, foreign concept to go to Chernobyl back then, it's even more of a foreign concept right now. I mean, not only, yeah, it's Chernobyl. It's where the worst uh, nuclear disaster up until Fukushima, maybe. Uh, but certainly on the scale of human beings being thrown into the mix, like you said, it's a unique Soviet solution to the problem. Uh, certainly to that extent, it was the worst nuclear disaster in the world. So it was foreign to me in 2015 to be on ground, seeing this place that was entirely deserted. Like you see it in pictures. You, you, of course, you know, we have all these pictures of post 30 year mark Chernobyl, how the nature is reclaiming the world. But until you go to the site and you see some of the smaller details, like you see trees that only grow on one side. You And that's the side that's facing reactor number four that it does not grow on. Mm -hmm. You see, um, I mean, I, I think some of the gas masks that were left behind, was that was a, like a political statement that they put there for tourists. Uh, but some of the other things, you know, the, the famous Ferris wheel, it was never actually open. It, it never went into operations because it was supposed to be open for May Day, which that's actually a different part of the story to it because the Soviets had the Ukrainians do their May Day celebration in Kyiv, which a lot of the Ukrainians in Kyiv got radiation sickness from going out during the May Day celebrations, which is when the, the Ferris wheel was supposed to be operational, was on the May Day celebrations. But, you know, some of those details, it's, it's, it's an in, insane way of traveling back in time. It's a really sad way of traveling back in time to know that this city, Pripyat, and the nuclear power station at Chernobyl was at one point, that was the elites. Those were the elites of the Soviet society. You had your smartest, brightest people working there and trying to... Uh, do things for the betterment of society. They even have a slogan on the outside uh, to where, you know, they're they're talking about, you know, we're doing this for the betterment of society, which is ironic, right? Mm. But 
it's until you go on ground and you see some of those details that um, even it's been 2015 till now, it's been seven years, seven years plus I've visited Chernobyl. Mm -hmm. A lot's happened. It still seems surreal. Like it's a, it, it shouldn't, I should not have been in that location, much less an, an incident happening in that location. Right. So I think it's probably fair to say that, uh, I mean, there's obviously going to be a, a lot of the audience who is familiar with Chernobyl, the story and the imagery from either the real images or from any number of the uh, pop culture related elements that have utilized Chernobyl, whether it's, um, you know, Call of Duty or Stalker, the, the HBO video games, show. the HBO show is, a, is a, obviously probably the most direct example um, mm -hmm. but how did you get to Chernobyl? Like what, what made huh. you, what made you want to go? And at what point in your travels did you sort of end up there? So, uh, it all originated from a conversation years before one of our mutual friends, Nicholas, uh, as as you know we were chatting and he was showing me hey you know ukrainians are opening up the chernobyl site for people to visit and mm -hmm. instantly i was hooked i knew it i knew i wanted to visit but i had to go to afghanistan first so oh okay so let's let's backtrack this a little bit so this was 2015 meaning in 2014 russian forces occupied crimea and i was in the military in 2014 so Going to Ukraine, you know, they, they stepped up the, the threat level on U.S. forces visiting Ukraine at that point because they knew that we were sort of lost children whenever we go traveling. They um, <laughs> make sure that we don't do silly things like go find ourselves in the eastern side and helping the locals back then uh, to cause international incidents. Mm -hmm. So my time in the military in 2014, I wanted to go so badly. But I didn't, I didn't go because I was still active duty. Now, technically, I was active duty when I went to Chernobyl in 2015. Um, well, I guess I'm out, so they can't really kick me out for saying things like this. But um, as I was leaving the, the military, all they asked for me was a return flight ticket to America. And they would clear me on, on the travel side. So I got a return ticket to America showed it and quickly canceled it and rebooked my ticket to Kiev oh my uh, for my, my first stop after the military. So technically I was on leave, but I was a wall to the max. Uh, well, I was not, I was not a wall per se. I was away on leave, but not a sanctioned location per se for an active duty army captain. Okay. So I found myself in Kyiv. That was the first stop. I, I, I went straight from Germany, flew into Kyiv, and there was a massive culture shock to begin with. And, and, and you know, Kyiv is pretty far away from Chernobyl, um, but still, um, I think my first place that I went to Kyiv, um, and this should tell you how much of an interest I had in, in it, was actually the Chernobyl Museum. And the Chernobyl Museum, where you were talking about those graphite uh, pieces that they showed, the, the replicas, they were, um, that entire museum is in a fire brigade location that the entire fire brigade or fire department for America um, responded to Chernobyl and none of them were able to go back to staff the fire department. Wow. And that's already to lay the groundwork of how sad and horrible the incident was. And, 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 so, and, and, and Henry, this is not to be confused with the Pripyat fire team who effectively no, all no, no. died, right? I mean, that they, they, they were almost right. Okay. Well, this one too, this one too. The, um, I, I think it was like the 16th fire brigade and uh, people in Kiev, uh, correct me if I'm wrong. I, that's, that's off of my memory of from like seven years ago. Um, but it was one of the district fire brigades in Kiev that, that also responded to the incident and, and went all the way up to wow. Pripyat and, and Chernobyl to, to deal with it. So that turned into the Chernobyl Museum and they had all these, uh, the outfits with the leather or with a rubber 
outfits that had the lead shields for the chests in the front. And that's where I learned about a lot of the backstory. Like, if you look at any of the Chernobyl uh, film from the evacuation of the town Pripyat back then, on the first days of the evac, you, you still see people that they were kind of disoriented in the film of the evacuation. Um, the interesting thing that a lot of people don't pick up is when you watch that type of film, don't just look at their faces, but you'll start seeing in the film that there's like little white, they almost look like cotton puffs that are popping around in the film. It looks like, if you don't know it, it almost looks like the photographer had like dust spots on the film or it was overexposed mm -hmm. to something. It looks like little small starbursts that go around. Those were actually radioactive particles that were in the atmosphere that was overexposing the film inside that you couldn't see when you were on site. But once the film was out, you know, and developed the film, and then it, you could see those little invisible particles that were very much in the atmosphere during that time that people were exposed to. So it's almost and, like a, almost a, a means of capturing, like visibly capturing the, uh, the radiation. Yeah. They thought they were going to come back in a matter of days or weeks. So they just packed up a single suitcase and left. Mm -hmm. They left their... They had to leave their pets too, um, ugh. but uh, that museum was the first spot sort of where I, I got a lot of my background on ground information and I got to see a lot of the, um, uh, the equipment that was used. Uh, but then I think it was two days after that, because uh, you have to book your trip uh, like a week in advance with the Ukrainian um, uh, travel agencies that have contact with the authorities. So then you meet up to, to get on the bus. And uh, interesting thing is I met up with uh, an American and a Georgian, and the Georgian was on R&R &R from fighting in uh, Donbass. And uh, yeah, he was, we, we ended up hanging out. The Georgian guy could read Russian, so he, he was helping translate a lot of the stuff that was on site. And we went out, and uh, as you get into the exclusion zone, there's there's a few checkpoints that you have to pass. When you start getting closer and closer, at one point, they have to even take your passport and issue uh, exclusion zone visas. Um, I didn't get a stamp or anything in it, but they basically document who's been in and out of the exclusion zone because there's a certain pop cap that you could have in it. Huh. Uh, but as we get closer and closer... Um, have you gotten any safety the... instruction at this point? Are they like... Has anybody like sat down with you and told you about... Like, yeah, you shouldn't be going here. <laughs> or, yeah, or yeah. yeah. Well, so that's... So there's, there's different kinds of tours. And obviously right now the tours are probably not happening. If yes, you're trying to look for one, for a number, or of rather, <laughs> rather, the official tours are not happening because right. there were two kinds of tours. You had your official tours, which is what I went with because I did not want to find a radioactive hot zone by myself. Um, or you have unofficial tours, which would be um, the stalker esque type of tours, the ghost tours, guys who are off the books trying to smuggle you into the exclusion zone etc which mm. is not recommended <laughs> uh, but with the official tours they gave us all geiger counters okay uh to hold on to and we kept we would uh, basically keep the um the reading to figure out how many millisieverts we got of radioaction dosage or radioactive dosage that day and actually, they give you a little certificate afterwards. I don't know where mine went. It shows you how many, uh, how much of a radioactive dose you got from your trip, uh, which is interesting because I mean that's that opens up a long, uh, a, a huge conversation because they they had those back in the day. They had those pen uh, Geiger counters or the the dosimeters, not Geiger counters, which was were chemical compounds that would change. Mm -hmm, so right. you would be able to tell, you know, if you've received, a, you know, an overage of, um, of radioactive material. And that's, that's back in the Soviet days, what you would be using. So similar to that, but much more technical, technologically advanced for us. Hmm. Uh, 
you know, a lot of us know about what happened on the uh, with, well, maybe not a lot of us, but most of us who are interested in it know about the Reactor 4 and the explosion on Reactor 4 and a lot of that type of stuff. But what really struck me was the effect on the civilian population. As, as you went in, you kind of saw where a lot of people lived. Uh, and there, honestly, there's not a lot of the villages still in existence because when the liquidators, and those are the Soviet mm -hmm. soldiers or staff that went through and basically had to clean the area, scrub the area per se, when the liquidators had to go through and uh, liquidate uh, villages, that meant that they had to, uh, not only did they have to bulldoze the houses, um, but they had to bury them six meters. Mm -hmm. Meters, not feet. Mm -hmm. um, so, Yeah, I, re I read was... somewhere, Henry, that it was something like, it was relatively equivalent to the number of places within, I'm thinking within, um, within Belarus, um, was where I had read it. Yeah. It was somewhere equivalent to the number of cities and towns leveled during the Nazi invasion in World War II. The equivalent yeah. number were completely buried during the cleanup yeah. of this to some, you know, to some shape or degree, at least on the same scale. Yeah, it was, it was, it's brutal. I mean, you see dots on the map that basically don't exist anymore. Yeah. Uh, and there's this one monument that you go through as you're going to Chernobyl, and it's just all of the town, uh, the the entry of the town, the signs um, of the town names, and it's all lined up, uh, headed towards the um, uh, the power plant. And at the time I visited in 2015, I think the the guide said there was this one old lady. She was like 80 or 90 years old. And every day she would still walk somewhere between 16 or 20 kilometers to get groceries and, and whatever. And she still lived in, in the exclusion zone. Wow. She just wouldn't leave. But the vast majority of the rest of it is just, it's a ghost town. Just empty. Um, yeah. yeah, but we, we would, I remember taking our uh, Geiger counters. Mm -hmm. And when we went to some of those sites where they had demolished and buried the buildings and you scanned the soil it would still just start beeping like crazy when you got when you got the geiger counter close how bad is yours this one only goes to uh, 10 11 the other one I had went up to 14. then here it was more i think but still no more than 11. Cool. Uh, especially like uh, we were near the hospital for one and the Georgian guy who was with us, he was, we were both flipping through some of the old uh, Soviet notes that were there and they, they had like names of patients and how much iodine they were giving them for radiation treatments and, and all that. And it, that, that is kind of nutty to go through and actually see the handwriting uh, very neat handwriting from the staff. So, I mean, it's from a different era when people could still write, you know? Yeah, right, uh, right. And, and it, it would, and when I say like, you know, time froze, that's, that's what I'm talking about. You find little small morsels that weren't cleaned up, weren't thrown away. So you were actually, were you actually at the hospital? Not the hospital. That is, that was not on our list because uh, as as you may know the that hospital that treated a lot of the firefighters yeah um, was heavily contaminated right. with radioactive material that they had to remove from the firefighters right and the people who who they initially brought out um but I, well, I did eat at the chow hall at uh at um chernobyl and they served us uh, Ukrainian food at the chow hall. I mean, not fancy Ukrainian food. <laughs> not radioactive, as far as I know, either. Uh, but I, I remember, like, on the way going to the chow hall, too, you had uh, you had to pass through the Red Forest. Um, we did not pass through by foot. Uh, the Red Forest, what it is, that, that's, that's where, uh, when the initial explosion happened, and the locals would say... Um, so I learned this from from the Chernobyl Museum in Kiev, and the locals said 
that the explosion was like a raspberry mm. purple color. Mm-hmm. It, it didn't look like a normal explosion. It didn't look like fire, like orange. It was like raspberry purple. And they said it was it was beautiful in the skies as it exploded. Um, and that initial explosion and the debris that came from it, uh, the wind carried it along the forest line, headed out. Um, and I've actually got it in my notes. And uh, as the explosion went out and the wind pushed it, pushed it through the um the red forest was that location where the fallout landed in the forest and the trees wouldn't grow right and it was it's kind of like a brownish color out there um and so if you're driving a vehicle and you have a geiger counter on you whenever you cross that that line the the pathway of the radioactive plume where the red forest is every single geiger counter would absolutely go like bonkers inside and it would get really loud because the radioactivity was still it was still there um <laughs> that's absolutely and nuts. That, that that's actually you know earlier there was that there were the russian soldiers well, that, that went into where, chernobyl that's where i'm i'm you know i'm thinking about this we just recently within the last you know within the last year this has hit the news of these soldiers who were, were entrenching right in mm-hmm. in the red forest it, that's mind blowing yeah. to me since wouldn't you imagine that they would know where to not go? You would assume that they would know where not to go. Um, but evidently not. I mean, they're saying that they're okay, but yeah, I think there's, there's been footage of those soldiers uh, leaving on stretchers, etc., which is, you know, receiving radioactive poisoning. Uh, but yeah, I mean, the in, the way the liquidators had to get rid of the radiation was to bury it. Mm-hmm. And that was a worse path because that was a path of where all the radioactive material was mm-hmm. leaving. And so, I mean, yeah, when I see um, stories like that, it just it, it blows my mind. I, I don't know what those officers But you are, drove through it. You drove through that yeah, area. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I did. Wow. I did. And the Geiger counters went nuts. <laughs> Every single Geiger counter that was on the... Uh, that was on our vehicle, you know, absolutely, you know, it, it, it sounded like that's all it was. We were all testing our Geiger counters at that point. We never got to go into reactor number four, but we got to stand um, outside. We got to see the actual reactor. Uh, and that's also another crazy thing, because there's a monument outside of the reactor. And if you're uh, standing behind the monument with a Geiger counter, uh, the monument actually, the concrete monument actually blocks the radio uh, radia- uh, radiation. Ah. But as soon as you step out with your Geiger counter, it starts beeping. And then you step b- back behind the monument and it stops beeping. That's unreal. So when you're saying it glows, that's that's what it's talking about. Wow. You know what? One of the things that I found most interesting, and probably you know my own naivete, just not knowing any better, you know, my assumption was, you know, the reactor there exploded, and you know, was basically everybody was evacuated, and it was it was coffined and closed. Um, but no, there there are what three other active reactors there? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I mean, uh, let me see. If I'm looking through my notes, at the very least, there was reactor four, and then right next to it, in right next to it, n- near the cooling pond, there's reactor number five and six that were still running after that, actually. So there's there's maybe even more than three other reactors that were in the area. Yeah. Hello, future Henry here. Now I didn't answer Josh's question completely. Uh, 
Reactor 1 through 3 were operational. Reactor 4 was the one that exploded. And Reactor 5 and 6 were under construction and never completed construction after the explosion in Reactor 4. Now, later on in 1991, Reactor number 2 suffered a fire and they never opened up Reactor 2 again. But Reactor 1 and Reactor 3 uh, operated until 1997 and the year 2000 subsequently before all the reactors were shut down and it, yeah. it's also true right that there's still teams on site at chernobyl trying to ensure that everything is controlled uh controlled as in the radiation is mm. controlled yeah yeah oh for sure i mean at this point it's it's a huge it's an international effort so when i said that in 2017 uh, there was a new cover, a new sarcophagus mm -hmm. is what you call it, right. uh, laid on it. That was led by a French company, um, but funded by the international community to build a new cover on it because the original Soviet cover, the one that I got to see, that was eroding and the right. uh, the readings were already increasing uh, into a an unsustainable level uh, for the environment. And... You know, early you were talking about the um, the liquidators that were on the roof uh, having to shovel things because the robots kept on breaking. Yes. Kind of like what we saw with the film exposure, having radioactive degradation to the film. Uh, when there was, there was a photographer that went up there to document the... Uh, the soldiers that were shoveling things into wheelbarrows and then trying to run in in 90 seconds, I believe, mm -hmm. or two minutes. Yeah. They were talking about uh, when you left the safe zone, well, quote unquote safe zone. Yeah. When you get that radiation on you, you start tasting this metallic mm. taste in your mouth. Like it tastes like you're eating pennies. Mm. Um, and at that point, uh, when this photographer was was taking photographs of them, uh, the interesting thing is if you ever look at any of those liquidator photographs from the rooftop, you'll see these little flames. It looks they look like flames coming from the bottom of the photographs. Uh, so back in the day when when we used thirty five millimeter film, um, I used to teach film when I was in college. That thirty five millimeter film, if you look at the side, it's got these little squares on it. And nowadays you only use it for like Instagram filter. It's got these little squares on the side. Those little squares are for a gears cog to stick into when when it's inside of a camera. So what that gear does, it helps guide the film into the camera. The photographs from the uh, the top of uh, reaction number four, those all looked like they had flames coming out the mm. bottom and they were all segmented uh, equally. And that was actually where that gear, the gear cog fit into the little squares in between. And it was blocking the gamma rays from coming up from underneath the camera. And so those gamma rays coming up from underneath were actually degrading the the uh, the film from inside or exposing the film from the inside mm -hmm. and it was it imprinted those weird uh, um, ghostly images on the bottom and that's again that's high radiation does weird things to objects that we know including film absolutely crazy now i know one yeah. of the other places that you got to go while you were there uh, while maybe not as well known in terms of like its um, its exposure, say on the Chernobyl show or covered in in general media, uh, but one which is probably very much in line with what you would see straight out of uh, Stalker or Call of Duty or PUBG or something of the something of that nature was the radar arrays. Yeah, yeah, Duga too. Um, or Duga B or Duga 2, one of the Duga arrays. Radio nerds here may, uh, in America would know this as the, the Russian woodpecker. Um, so really close to the reactor, um, there is a very large radio uh, array. What, what that means is it's, it's basically a grid of radio antennas uh, that's along 
that area. 500 meters long, I believe, and 100 meter tall. So they were. It was a very tall structure and and very striking structure. But it was, it was actually uh, classified up until 2014 or 2015. And that structure itself, it's in conjunction with two other uh, radio arrays that were there to bounce a um, a signal uh, along the ionosphere to detect the uh, American ICBMs that were being launched across the, the polar Arctic Circle. And so um, the interesting thing about the, the, the array, I mean, it's no... It's no mystery why it's next to a power station. I mean, you need a lot of power to power a large radio uh, station, a, a large radio antenna. But the uh, the array actually did not function uh, initially during the launch because it, it interfered with the Soviet uh, the aircraft. They have a like an emergency beacon signal. The frequency was messing with the Soviet aircraft uh, emergency signals. And so they actually had to stop it and then rework a lot of it. And that was like one of the worst uh, projects that wasted a lot of rubles for the Soviet Union. Uh, but once they got it to, to sort of work, it, it became known as the Russian woodpecker in America because it would give out this like signal. It, it sounded like a woodpecker. So future Henry here. Turns out there was an error in my notes. So there were three major stations for the Duga system. You had Duga, which was in Mykolaiv in South Ukraine. You had Duga-1, which is what we're looking at here, codenamed Chernobyl-2. And then we had the third unit, uh, Duga-2, that was in Khabarovsk Krai, which is close to Japan. And this is what it sounded like to American amateur ham radio operators. And so ham radio enthusiasts would try to try to hunt for the Russian woodpecker. They would try to look for that signal in the radio waves because, of course, the Soviets were bouncing it across the ionosphere uh, into America. And the reason you have to bounce it on the ionosphere, I realize this is not entirely Chernobyl, is because the world is round. I hope you can accept that out there. I know for some that is a controversial topic, but the world is round. So radio signals, uh, if they bounce it along the ionosphere, you don't have to work with a uh, line of sight system. So it doesn't have to be straight out. And so, of course, if you launch ICBMs, it goes a along right. the curvature of the world. Right. And it would, it would then be able to reflect that signal back and you would be able to detect it. Huh. Um, but anyways, I ended up getting to uh, climb the Duga array, and uh, I mean that was that was pretty sketch. I mean you're climbing a a really old Soviet structure that had not been maintained for thirty years, and like stuff was, Josh, stuff was falling off of the array as we were climbing up. It seems and safe and reasonable. Go on. I was not a dad at that point. I, <laughs> my risk level was different. I was also freshly out of the army to where I just did not have to... Um, I did not care Yes. Uh, about uh, my safety as much as I do probably now. And so, yeah, my risk tolerance was a little bit different back then. Right, But okay. it was... It was, it was, again, you know, the time frame that it went in 2015 was really unique because the Duga systems were just declassified. So you could go visit the Duga system as just a free person. Ah, uh, okay. The new sarcophagus had not been placed in. The, the war in Donbass was still very, um, very isolated towards the east at that point. So um, a lot of those things added together were just, that was just a unique a unique kind of mix of everything that, that, you know, I was lucky enough to experience. So you've climbed up the top of this crazy radar array that's falling apart as you're doing it. You're driving through the red forest, standing in front of reactor four, as you said, risk probably wasn't at the top of your mind at this point in time. 
where else did you go while you were in Pripyat? Well, the, technically, that wasn't Pripyat, uh, the the uh, radar array, nor was the actual power station in Pripyat. Right, right. Uh, it's Pripyat out, was, outside the city. I've got you, right? Yeah, yeah. Pripyat was its own separate entity from, from those locations. Right. And um, so Pripyat was... Back then, it was what they called a, a model Soviet city. They only sent their best people there because the power station itself was a pride of the Soviet Union. Mm. Um, that itself showed the world how the Soviets were pressing forward with a different fuel source, and they had the intellectual and scientific might to make this happen. And so the city of Pripyat attracted the elites of the Soviet Union. The cinema was nicer than anywhere else. The, uh, the sports facilities, that's why the, uh, the track and field complex was to be proud of. The streets were always clean and, and the, uh, the plants were always watered. I mean, the, the entire city itself was the best of the best. Um, obviously, you know, coming from the Western standard, there are certain things that not necessarily saying that it's it's bad, but it's Soviet looking. <laughs> you know, the, you could clearly see as nice as it, as it was, it was a planned, uh, a sort of a communally planned layout and the housing was um, uh, communist, <laughs> you know, the best way I could say it. Uh, but but nonetheless, you know, still planned. And we, we still went to... When you went between different checkpoints in in the exclusion zone, they had uh, they had these machines to check the radiation levels right. on you, uh, but they they didn't work when we were going. You could just like go in and put your arms there, and and it would secure your arms, and it would give you a reading on how much you know radiation you're exhibiting. Yeah. Yeah. Mine's not working. Oh, yeah. The stadium was where I saw those trees that only grew on one side. I saw a lot, a lot of wildlife going in, uh, little foxes running around. And then we went through a lot of the living compounds, sort of the, the buildings that were there. And we got to see a lot of the places that were in the film, uh, in the films, the evacuation films that I saw at the museum. Just going through some 30 year old apartment that someone left on a whim uh, and multiply that by an entire city complex. I realize that some of our listeners uh, have played Call of Duty and there is a very famous level on Call of Duty uh, called Old Gillied Up and it specifically was in Pripyat. And uh, I think they did a pretty good job at laying out how the city of Pripyat looked like because they actually got the sports complex right. They, there's a swimming pool in, in the stage, mm -hmm. uh, I believe. Mm -hmm. And there's also, uh, I don't know if they got the cinema, but absolutely at the end, the Ferris wheel looked exactly like a carbon copy of, of where I went. Except uh, there just wasn't that much activity in Pripyat. Uh, now, obviously, in the game, is supposed to be some illegal dealings and people running around there, but it was an absolute ghost town. But the layout was actually, if you wanted a frame of reference as you're going through Pripyat um, in, in, the, in the game, it actually looks very similar. Fairly now, accurate. That's actually kind of wild. Right. Yeah. Yeah, but now, now, now here's one thing, though. Um, the fires. That's one thing I noted at the very end that, you know, talking to the Ukrainians who were leading us through, wildfires are a big threat to that area because if you get wildfires uh, that brings up all the radioactive material that's on the ground and pushes it into the sky oh wow and so and so that that yeah that turns into a a, a very a very scary threat for the surrounding area because then you're repopulating a lot of the radioactive material so in the game, they had fires all over the place. And I remembered mm -hmm. after visiting that place, I watched someone play the, that level. And I, that's the first thing that came to my mind. There's too many fires mm. in, in the game because the, those fires should not be there. And so that's also 
something that was sort of scary for me to think about when I think when the Russian soldiers went in to the area, they were like shelling the, the place too, right? And and some of them started fires, which that that's a really scary thought. Mm-hmm. Now, those radioactive clouds, I think people don't realize uh, how much of it actually also contaminated the Belarusian side of things. Right. Because it's right on the border between Ukraine and Belarus. I think it wasn't Belarus and actually like the most affected area. I, I'm not sure, but I know there was a huge effect in, in the Belarusian side as well. Yeah. And at one point when, um, you know, the radioactive plume I was talking about, it was actually headed to Moscow. Uh, they, the Soviets actually ended up flying, flying flights up into where the, a radioactive cloud was and they were dropping uh dry ice co2 to seed the clouds so it would rain they artificially made it rain so it would remove all of those particles that were in the sky and a lot of that came down in the belarusian countryside Unreal. so yeah so that's again that's i it i'm not trying to paint the russians as evil right here per se <laughs> but um, well, it's not even the I, Russians. I mean, the USSR had some very questionable decisions. Well, the, no. The, at this point, though, at this point, when you're looking at a giant radioactive plume that's headed to Moscow during May Day, and people are going to be in the streets. Yeah, lesser of two um, evils, yeah. Right. The lesser of two evils is, all right, let's see if this would work. Let's seed the clouds and, and see if it could wash out any of yeah. the radioactive waste in the sky instead of contaminating most of Moscow. Yeah. Uh, it, yeah, you know, like if you trace back, yeah, you know, uh, the one of the big one of the big issues they ran into uh, was the design of the reactor, right? Um, that they classified the um, the the problem, the inherent problem to the reactor design. Yes. My understanding is that the Soviet RBMK reactor, when it's when it's being pulled out. Uh, and then you have to like you have to cool it real quick. It has graphite tips mm. in it, right? Well, the tips of the rods, right? The, the, so, the tips of the rods, right? So as I understand it, again, I'm probably speaking outside of our depth a little bit here, but we're not nuclear <laughs> si- physicists yes. right here. So if you are out there, please educate us, right? Because so we would like to learn. <laughs> my understanding <laughs> was that the core was poisoned. With a buildup of, of, I think it's uh, xenon, right? Mm-hmm. So yeah, the yeah, core, right. the, it, normally the xenon burns off when the temperature is high enough and the core is functioning normally. But because they had reduced all of the power down on the core, it had built up xenon and not burned it off. And the xenon sort of tamp, like, uh, inhibits the, the reaction uh, of, the, of the uranium, right? So it, it mm-hmm. makes it less reactive. Um, if that's Mm -hmm. even the right word. And so the rods, which are designed to control the reaction and are made predominantly of, I believe it's boron, were all removed from the core. And then as the power was reintroduced and the xenon burned off in the core, suddenly this massive surge takes place as all of the controls have been removed. And as they hit the emergency stop to effectively jam all the control rods back in, because the tips of them were indeed graphite instead of boron, as they did that and they all started to go back in, instead of controlling the reaction, it had the inverse effect. And it actually supercharged the reaction, making it worse. That's that's my very uh, high school knowledge understanding of what took place well i mean and and the the big the on the hu- human side uh as the soviet community was a very in my opinion a very militant way of operating very top down you need to yes. listen you need yes. to follow orders um you know what the chairman says is is bad is bad um, what is classified is classified despite what what you think and 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 there are Pluses and minuses to this, um, in my opinion, a, a few more minuses than pluses in this particular example. Right. 
I mean, the the whole the whole thing on why the incident was examined was because it was a reflection of how that arrangement of power had progressed this major flaw in the reactor into ultimately killing a lot of people, a lot of people who voluntarily put their lives out there to save the world. And, um, and to take that a step further, Henry, you know, I, the entire, at least the HBO show about this, which I've actually read is fairly accurate in terms of its representation of what took place. And, you know, one of the primary um, scientists involved in sort of determining how this style of reactor exploded, um, their specific involvement in the way it's presented at the very least and, you know, sort of an adapted from reality uh, work was they bring this to light and they say publicly what was uh, incorrect or, you know, against the party's uh, prevailing line of thought, as you've described, because there were other reactors of the same design still in operation uh, throughout the Soviet Union. And there was a moment of you know, one of the what you might call it heroic moments of identifying that it had to be talked about. And then I believe the same individual ends up killing themselves shortly thereafter or, or some years later. Yeah. Yeah. It's, the entire affair is just steeped with sorrow. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, heroism is absolutely there. There's, there's, you know, the love between, uh, between all the people who live there and there's the heroic sacrifice of people going in to, to, prevent the entire place from melting down i think the hbo show did a really good job at portraying the miners that yes. went in yes um, because at, at one point they needed miners to go in to uh super cool the the to help super cool the core um, right to, di to uh, dig a, a channel in towards the core to be able to give them access right yeah yeah and 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 that was one thing i remember when i was on the tour that was actually something I hadn't read much about. And I was thinking like, what in the world are you talking about? These miners going in. Uh, but then that, that did stick with me. And, and I did remember uh, the story about the miners, but the HBO show showing that they actually, and, and I remember them talking about it, like going in naked because it was so hot. That whole event actually did happen. And those guys volunteered to do that. Yeah. You know? They they knew what was going on. They volunteered to go. Yeah. So uh, that I think that side of it for a lot of people in the West, and a lot of people in the West get a reputation of being very self centered. I think a lot of ways what we could learn from this is some of that some of that self sacrifice. Even even if I could channel like a portion of that to the society, mm -hmm. that's incredible. Mm -hmm. That that itself is incredible. Instead of being self centered and just running away from the issue, because if if everyone during Chernobyl ran away from the issue, um, Europe would cease to exist right. at this point because it would have had the secondary explosion and all of that radioactive material would have gone everywhere. It is an expressly interesting view at the human condition, isn't it? Because when you think about things in our sphere in our lifetime, where we may know people or have met people in, in some way, shape, or degree, or at least know of people who have undertaken similar risk or circumstance. Like I'm thinking of 9-11 specifically and, you know, like first responders running into the towers knowing that there is a high likelihood of death and, you know, ultimately dying. It, it's um, that decision to do that is an interesting view of the human condition. I don't know any other way to put it. It's like you say, mm -hmm. it's so so very difficult to try to transplant yourself into that scenario and go, oh yeah, that's what I would do. Because um, I think it's contrary in many ways to, yeah, to human nature in, in many ways. Yeah. And to the flip side of that, um, I think, and I don't know if this is because of uh, military service that makes me think of this more, um, I think the absolute evil of this is exploiting some people's 
good nature of self-sacrifice in order to obtain, let's say, evil ways, just yeah. selfish ways and yeah. sacrificing those who are actually some of the best people that we have in the society to have around. A favorable result to the state at the detriment of those individuals, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, very, yeah. very much so. But uh, that's, a, that's a hell of a conundrum to, to, to leave everybody off with. But I think those are some of the mixed feelings that I got after I left Chernobyl, um, is seeing the best and the worst of humanity and the results of it, and sort of this, this physical scar on Earth that is here to remind us, uh, likely for a very, very long time. Well, with that said, guys, thanks for tuning into this episode of Nine Hole Podcasts. If you guys haven't caught some of the other shows that we've done, be sure to check out the channel and find us all on all of the standard podcasting sites. And until next time, we'll see you on the range. Now, everybody else who is still here, you're probably on the YouTube channel. I could put up a few clips from my travels back then, and namely one of them that's I found pretty interesting. Uh, I ended up uh, in, in the nuclear reactor ponds, uh, the, the cooling ponds, that, that the water that would be pumped into the reactor coolers. Because that's a, another safe place that you should be. Oh, absolutely. There's fish living in there, catfish to be exact. Do they have two and, heads? Uh, well, no, but they're massive. Like, and I'll, I'll, I'll play a video right now and you guys could watch that video and I'll leave you off with some radioactive catfish. So we're hanging out in Chernobyl. This is a normal sized bread. We're gonna feed some atomic catfish. You get how big they are? <laughs> you just ate the whole piece of bread. Here's another one. No one wants it. No.